Hello and welcome to Explore TBR, the channel dedicated to finding, mapping and exploring what remains of the historic Thailand to Burma Railway. In this video, we're going to explore the Takanun section of the railway. The name Takanun came from the Thai name for this area. Ta meaning pier because this area was mainly accessible by river, and Kanun means jackfruit trees. But the nearest town is actually now called Tong Papum. Takanun was an important point along the railway, both for the POWs and the Japanese. Many of the POWs were familiar with Takanun. Several thousand of them worked in the camps in this area, but a great many more passed through Takanun on their way farther up the line towards Burma. You can find mention of Takanun in many of the POW's diaries and memoirs. Takanun was also an important point on the railway for the Japanese, as it was a major hospital and supply camp. At its lowest level during the dry season, the river was impassable beyond Takanun, so all supply boats were unloaded here. The Japanese camp in this area was very large, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. Takanun is a long way from Kanchanaburi here. You need to travel about 140 kilometers up Highway 323, past Tarso, past Hellfire Pass, and Kinsayok, Indat, Prankasi, and all the way to the town of Tong Papum here, which you will need to use as a base if you want to explore this part of the railway. Takanun Railway Station was at the 218 km point along the railway, nearly 170 km up the line from Kanchanaburi, and located here inside this triangle of roads, just east of town. This video will cover the length of railway from the Takanun Railway Station here, up to the hydroelectric dam which currently floods the rest of the railway as far as Timongta. It's a very long section, a little over 9 km in total. Let's have a look at some of the features you will find along this stretch of the railway, starting at Takanun Railway Station inside this triangle of roads. The Japanese schematic at Takanun Station shows a simple passing siding with the third track indicated by a dotted line. This third track may have never been completed as aerial photos and the detailed interpretive report only indicate two tracks located here. For this map, each white or black section of the railway is about 50 meters on the ground so this siding was around 350 meters in length. Of course, the railway station is long gone, and there is little left of the railway, but some evidence of it can be found here. Photo 1 shows the wide embankment covered in ballast, where the two tracks are rejoining into one, facing northwest. Part of the embankment has been either dug up or washed away. The line then crosses Highway 323 and through the grounds of Wat Takanun and follows an embankment which now has viewing platforms constructed on both sides of the line. Photo 2 shows the very overgrown condition of the line in September 2023, looking back towards Wat Takanun. This road and many others near Highway 323 have been covered by Google Street View cameras, so you can see some of the places I will cover in this video on Google Street View. The railway trace runs across private property here and emerges at this road here, where the railway is still on flat land. But beginning at this road, the railway starts climbing an embankment which reaches 3 meters in height at the point where bridge Q480 begins. Photo 3 shows the embankment looking back towards the road. There is a deep layer of ballast along the top of this embankment. The bridge Q480 is listed in the DIR as a 135-foot viaduct over low ground. If you are new to the channel, I explain the Q numbers and DIR in another video called the Tonchan Bridges. You may want to have a look at that one if you haven't done so already. At this point, I must say another big thank you to Stefan Zing, who was extremely helpful in identifying the bridge locations through the Takanun area. North of Q480, the railway line cuts through a ridge. The railway passes first through a short cutting, then follows a ledge quite high above the road here, again visible on Google's street view. You can see the railway line ran along the flat top of this high embankment. The railway then extends out onto a short but high embankment leading up to bridge Q479, a 60-foot bridge over a stream and gorge but I saw no running streams at any of the bridge sites when I was here in the dry season, so all these streams were only active during the rainy season. Photo 4 shows what remains of bridge Q479 as viewed from the road. The Takanun South POW camp was located on the west side of the railway, between these two bridges. 
In its early days, it was apparently located closer to the river on this point here, but successive rounds of flooding pushed the camp up to higher ground on this bluff overlooking the river, as documented in Martin Fryer's excellent book From the Woodlands to the Jungle. I'll show all of my book references at the end of the video. The POWs at Takanoon South Camp were tasked with railway construction as far as the bridge over the Oolong River, a couple of kilometres to the north. Beyond bridge Q479, the railway continues along a ledge which flattened out to a point where the current road meets the railway, and then passes through a long but shallow earth cutting. A few hundred metres farther along, the railway passes through a deeper rocky cutting before reaching bridge Q478, a 135-foot bridge over a deep ravine, with high approach embankments on either side. The road here makes a wide detour around this ravine. Photo 5 was taken in this cutting, looking towards the bridge. You can see the road make a sharp turn along the edge of the ravine, whereas the railway continued straight along the embankment to the bridge. Another point of interest nearby is a wartime anti-aircraft battery, located at this point on a hill which overlooked the entire valley in this area. The local people have apparently found spent anti-aircraft shell casings at this location in the past, but it seems like none remain today. This gun position would have given commanding views to the south looking over Takanoon South Camp and sweeping around over the Japanese camp and the other camps farther north up the valley and all the bridges along the way. Any Allied reconnaissance or bombing missions coming down the valley would have been in the line of fire from this position. Beyond Bridge 478 was the large Japanese hospital and transport camp on the west side of the railway. This photo from the book Railway Men in the War by Kazuo Tamayama shows the section of the camp where riverboats tied up along the banks in this semicircular bay here. The photo appears to have been taken from the bridge. This photo shows the Japanese camp at Takanoon, also found in the book Railway Men in the War. Another photo of Takanoon shows the funeral for Sergeant Okamura of the 9th Railway Regiment, who died of cholera at Takanoon, as found in the book Distant Whistle by Shimizu Ryujin. You can see parts of the distinctive Takanoon Mountain skyline in both photos. This was apparently a very large camp, although I don't have much information about exactly what was here or where. From the description in the interpretive reports, it seems like the larger part of the camp was farther north, which we'll get to in a moment. The railway continues through another short cutting, shown in photo 6, looking south, and then passes across a low embankment. Halfway across this embankment, there is a locked gate, and from this point all the way to the Q475 bridge, the railway trace is not accessible. From this gate, you can see that the railway passes through a low earth cutting marked with approximate coordinates here. The railway passed across bridge Q477, a short bridge over a stream, rounded a bend to the right and over another bridge Q476, reported as a 45-foot bridge over a stream and gorge. Then around another right-hand bend to bridge Q475, a very high 185-foot viaduct over the Oolong River. I believe the Japanese camp extended all the way to this point. The interpretive reports mention a large camp between the Oolong River Bridge and the next bridge to the south, which would have been this section. The reports mention a passing siding 280 yards long, with a camp on both sides consisting of 9 huts 120 by 30 feet, 20 huts 70 by 30 feet, and numerous smaller huts between 50 and 100 feet. So this was a rather large camp and would have occupied much of this area. This photo, also from Distant Whistle, shows bridge construction at Takanoon. Exactly which bridge is not clear, but bridge Q475 over the Oolong River here is the most prominent bridge in the area, so it's quite likely that it is this one. Photo 7 shows the remains of the concrete bridge foundations still visible in the river. This photo was taken from the north side of the riverbank here, where the railway is still accessible. From here, the railway made a broad sweeping bend to the north and west, although it has been ploughed under to make way for agricultural fields. Our group stopped for a break at this junction, and I was able to take photo 8 from this point just as the sun was setting behind the mountains, looking back in the direction of the Japanese camp. That distinctive Takanoon mountain skyline matched up perfectly with the old wartime camp photo, which must have been taken a kilometre or so to the southwest, but facing exactly the same direction. 
Continuing north, there was a short bridge over a stream located here, but there's no trace of it now, only flat level fields. On the west side of the railway, Takanoon Australian camp was located here. While the rest of F Force had moved onwards to the Burmese border area, two groups of Australian POWs, around 700 in all, turned around at Konkawita and returned to Takanoon and set up camp here, often called Pond's Camp after the Australian commander of the group, Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Pond. There was reportedly also a Ramusha camp on the opposite side of the railway. Of course, along the length of the railway, there were many more Ramusha camps than Allied POW camps, but accurate details of the locations and numbers were not kept as they didn't fall under any kind of military organization and discipline. A little farther north, we can find the trace of the railway again as it moves into rougher terrain. Bridge Q473 can be found just off the road with its approach embankments on either end, although the east end is quite overgrown and difficult to spot. From here, the road generally follows the railway for a considerable distance. First, over an embankment around 80 meters long and quite high. On the north side of the embankment, you can see the pits where all soil was removed to build the embankment, leaving only the surrounding bedrock behind. The railway then crosses a long ledge cut into the hillside, then through a short cutting, arrives at bridge Q472. This spot is a bit of a mystery to me. The bridge was recorded as a short bridge over stream in the interpretive reports from recon flights. This photo from Warmenhaven's book The Death Railway was not taken at Takanoon, but it shows very clearly a typical short bridge over stream. They were only one single span across a short gap in the embankment. This sketch is from Robert Hardy's book The Burma Siam Railway and shows Takanoon Base Camp drawn from a point to the north of the railway, looking back over the railway into the camp. The bridge noted in the recon reports is clearly visible in the sketch, and it's clearly a typical short bridge over a stream. And yet the remains of the bridge today suggest a much larger structure with a span of around 120 feet. I suspect that sometime in the years after the war, an exceptionally heavy monsoon season washed through the small gap, carrying away part of the embankment and leaving a much larger gap which can now be mistaken for the remains of a large bridge. Immediately south of the bridge was Takanoon Base Camp, the headquarters camp for Group 2 of the POWs. Around 1,200 POWs lived and worked here. The conditions and events in this camp are covered extensively in the book by Robert Hardy, medical officer here at Takanoon Base Camp. It's well worth reading if you're interested in this area. Moving up the line from Takanoon Base Camp, the railway rounded a bend through a cutting at the foot of this hill. Photo 9 shows this cutting looking southeast back towards the camp. Then across bridge Q471, another short bridge over a stream, although like all the other short bridges in this section, there's no evidence of it left today. Across Q470, a 55 foot long bridge over a stream, although it's now just a long dip in the road. And then the short bridge Q469. Then we arrive at a short cutting shown in photo 10 looking south. Across Q468, which was a 40-foot bridge, but is now again only a rough dip in the road, and the short bridge Q467, through another cutting, across the short Q466, and a little farther north we come to probably the most famous feature along the Takanoon section of the railway, the enormous 770-foot long ledge cut into a solid rock face above the river. Bridge Q465, 120 feet long, spanned the gap between the end of the approach embankment and the ledge. Photo 11 shows the size of the cliff here, but no photo can do justice to this spot. The scale of this ledge can only be appreciated when standing on it, with the cliff towering overhead. The amount of rock that needed to be blasted away is enormous. This photo from the Renichi Sugano collection shows the ledge during the war, taken from just around the curve looking back at the ledge. It is quite overgrown now, but the wartime photo clearly shows the huge mass of rock rubble pushed down the slope into the river. You can also make out bridge Q465 at the far end of the ledge. Work on this ledge would have been utterly deadly. These two photos from Distant Whistle are not from Takanoon. They show similar work at Kurian Krai farther up the line. Nevertheless, I show them here to illustrate what the conditions would have been like here at Takanoon. 
Imagine the difficulty of the POWs, weak from starvation and thirst, suffering from awful diseases and abuse, crawling like ants across the rock face high above. Imagine how slippery this would have been in the rainy season, usually barefoot with mud, water and rocks coming down from above. A fatal accident could come at any moment, but still you are beaten and forced to slave on. It must have been terrifying. Leaving the ledge, the railway curves to the west and Takanu North Camp was in a low-lying area between the river and the railway here. The recon reports list this camp as having 10 huts around 70 by 20 feet in size. The cookhouse must have been in the southern part of the camp here because one of the cooking stoves can still be found dug into the hillside, shown in photo 12. The stove is a smooth-walled circular pit dug from the hard earth and would have supported one of the giant cooking qualies on top of it, with the fire being fed through the gap in the front. There would likely have been a row of these stoves, but only one is still visible today. Just to the north of the camp stood the enormous bridge Q464, a 240-foot-long viaduct over low ground. Further west, the railway again curved along a cutting through the foot of a hill, followed by a large embankment over low ground. As the ground on the right rises, the embankment becomes a ledge, and then another cutting as the railway cuts through the base of another hill. This cutting ends at a short ravine spanned by the short bridge Q463, but across this bridge the line enters another cutting through higher ground. Photo 13 shows this cutting looking northwest, with the railway trace curving to the left through the cutting. The line twists and turns, following the contours of the terrain, and comes to a pair of large viaducts, Q462 120 feet long over low ground, and Q461 100 feet long over a stream and gorge. The DIR 39 report refers to a camp of only two huts on the south side of the railway between these two viaducts, probably another of the innumerable Romosha camps scattered along the line. Moving west, the railway passed through yet another cutting, shown in photo 14 looking back east. The rough dirt road which has generally followed the railway up to this point passed through the gap which was Q461 and passes to the south of the cutting and then ends. This is as far as you can drive even in a four-wheel drive vehicle and the rest of the way is only accessible by pushing through the jungle. The railway trace continues westwards over bridge Q460, a 175-foot viaduct over a stream and gorge, before passing through a very long cutting, around 150 meters long and 5 meters deep through earth. Photo 15 shows this cutting, looking back to the east. The line curves to the right and passes over a short embankment, and then comes to bridge Q459, a 130-foot viaduct over a stream and gorge. As I mentioned earlier, none of these streams were flowing when I was there in December 2023. Everything was very dry. The railway then passed through another very long cutting, almost identical to the previous cutting 12. Just after this cutting is another mystery at this bend. There appears to have been a large bridge between this cutting and the next embankment. However, in the interpretive reports and aerial photos, there was no bridge here. So I suspect this is another point where particularly bad flooding washed away part of the railway, leaving behind a gap which looks like a former bridge site. Beyond this point lies a long embankment, followed by the last cutting in this section of the railway, around 100 meters long but not very deep. Photo 16 shows this cutting, very overgrown, looking back towards the south. The railway continues north, over bridge Q457, a short 30-foot bridge over a stream, and then the trace disappears around 50 meters beyond. Beyond this point, the construction of the dam carved out these shelves and this flat area, and all the earth and rock above it, including the railway, was excavated and removed. Photo 17, looking towards the name on the dam, shows the group of us who explored this section together. From left to right are P3, Tiger, Ja, Tong, myself, Kun Kui Pai, Copter, Alex, and Mr. Lek. I must give a huge thank you to these people. To Alex for organizing this trip and inviting me along. To Kun Kui Pai for sharing his knowledge of the railway and related sites and driving us safely and expertly in his 4x4. To P3 for carrying the photography gear. And to Tiger for his hard work with the machete clearing the way for the rest of us and to Ja, Tong, Copter, Mr. Lek, and again to Alex for adopting me into their group of railway enthusiasts. Truly a bunch of stars. 
So that's as far as we got and where the railway ends at Takanun. Just for completion, the river followed this path during the war before the dam permanently altered its course. The railway followed what would have been the hillside along the riverbank over the 45-foot long bridge Q456, curving west along the 95-foot viaduct Q455, and then north towards Namchon Yai Station underwater a couple of kilometers beyond the dam. So how can you get here to explore the Takanoon area? First, it must be said that this Takanoon section is going to be a very difficult section of the railway to explore. It is obviously not a day trip from Kanchanaburi. You will need to use Tong Papum as your base, and you'll need at least two days here to explore the entire railway. Furthermore, much of the railway is a long way down a road which ranges from very rough in the dry season to impassable in the wet season. It is easiest to talk about the Takanoon section in two halves. The south half, from Takanoon Railway Station up to the locked gate, just past what I called cutting three in the map. And then the north half, from Q475 over the Oolong River, all the way to the end of the railway at Q457. Exploring the south end of the railway is not difficult, as you'll never be far from your vehicle, and it will be easy to bring plenty of water and snacks along, and the south end is quite easy to access. You can park at Wat Takanoon and explore the area around the railway station at your convenience, as well as the embankment behind the Wat. Then drive up the highway to this road and turn in. A few hundred meters down you will find the point where the railway crosses and the embankment starts. A little farther down, turn right and the road follows alongside the railway and then follows exactly on top of the railway the whole way to the gate, except where it detours around the Q478 ravine. If you want to explore the hilltop where the anti-aircraft guns were located, that is somewhat more difficult. Go back down to the highway and go half a kilometer or so up to this road. Turn left, go in another 400 meters to this road and turn left again. Go as far as you can up this road, it will eventually end somewhere around here and you'll need to go the rest of the way on foot. There is no marked trail though and it will very likely be overgrown with weeds. This white line shows the GPS trail where I walked, but I don't think this will help you much. I don't recommend that you go in here unless you have a guide who knows specifically how to reach that hilltop. To get to the north section of the railway, keep going up this road. Just across the bridge over the Oolong River here, turn left and keep following the road and you will arrive at this point. You can go down the road between these fields and talk to the landowner at his house here and ask his permission to walk down to the bridge site. Be sure to get his permission because there are some truly ferocious dogs here. The worst one of them is chained up in a cage, but even the better ones look like they eat trespassers for breakfast. Exploring farther north, follow this road. It is close to the railway trace, but there's nothing left to see here. You will pass through the area where Ponds Camp was located, then the road swings closer to the railway at bridge Q473 and is generally on top of the railway line from here onwards, except where it detours around ravines where bridges no longer exist. The road crosses the huge Takanoon ledge and beyond all the way to this point at the end of what I called Cutting 11, where the road ends and you'll need to proceed the rest of the way, a little more than a kilometer, on foot. The path is very overgrown and tough going, and at times hard to follow, but with my GPS points you should be able to find your way back onto the railway again if you stray off the line. However, I must stress that this road along the north half is only a dirt track and is very rough in places, and a normal car will certainly get stuck in the ruts and gullies. I have seen a motorcyclist on a typical Thai scooter get as far as the big ledge, but I wouldn't advise it unless you are a very competent rider. I would suggest you try to find an experienced off-road driver with a 4x4 vehicle capable of handling very rough terrain and who knows where they are going. I was extremely fortunate to be invited along with a group who had exactly that, Kun Kuipai. Without Alex making all the arrangements and inviting me to join his group, I would not have been able to explore this area. So yet again, a huge thank you to him. So that's it. 
Thanks very much for watching. I hope you found this interesting or informative. If so, please give the video a like and feel free to subscribe and check out the other videos on different sections of the railway. And if you are able to find a way to get out here to Takanoon and explore this area, then that's excellent and congratulations to you. It's going to be a very rewarding experience along one of the most famous sections of the Thailand-Burma Railway. Please let me know how it went in the comments below. I'd really like to hear from you. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.
Thank you.